I remember learning about stem and leaf diagrams when I was a statistics student. And I remember thinking at the time that they didn't seem particularly useful as a descriptive statistic. Or at the very least, they didn't seem to be worth the time and effort that it took to create them. We already had histograms, frequency tables. Why did we need a stem and leaf diagram? Well, since that time, having used stem and leaf diagrams and having found much easier ways of creating them, I've really come to appreciate what they offer us. And so I'm going to teach you more about stem and leaf diagrams, how to create them, and exactly what they are. Because I think that stem and leaf diagrams are the best of both worlds. And let me tell you what I mean. When we are displaying continuous data, we can put those data into a histogram and we will see the shape of the data. In this case, we see a bimodal distribution, something that we could not see in a frequency table. However, if I ask you how many people scored a six in this data set, it's very difficult to make that determination. We've lost the individual scores. Now, on the other hand, a frequency table preserves those individual scores. We put our data into columns with counts, relative frequencies, and percentiles, and now we can see exactly how many people scored in each category and what their percentage was. However, we can't see the shape of the distribution. Is this distribution bimodal or normally distributed? There's no way to tell simply from a frequency diagram. Here's what I mean about stem and leaf diagrams being the best of both worlds. This is what a stem and leaf diagram looks like. This stem and leaf shows the rank order and the shape of the distribution for our quantitative data. For instance, we can see the frequency of every score in the data set. We can see how many scores there were and we can see the shape. In fact, this rather resembles a histogram that has been turned sideways. Why is a stem and leaf the best of both worlds? Because it preserves the original values and it reveals the shape of the data. Now, in order to use a stem and leaf diagram or to interpret the data that you find in one, I want to take you back to some math that you learned back in third, fourth, fifth grade. Let's talk about numbers and their places. As children, we learn counting using numbers one through nine. Having a single number, we could describe as having a value in the ones place of a set of numbers. And if we only have nine digits, we're limited to counting only numbers one through nine. But with the invention of zero, we are now able to extend our counting by adding a second number in the tens place giving us a two-digit number. And this will allow us to count up to values of 99. Once we reach 99, we could extend our counting still further by adding a third number, this time in the hundreds place. And once we get to 999, we could extend our counting by adding yet another number in the thousands place. Now here, I'm dealing with four-digit numbers but we could go much beyond this, continuing to add more numbers in subsequent places. For our purposes, however, in understanding the stem and leaf diagram, this is all the further that we need to go. What we're going to do with a stem and leaf is use numbers in the tens place and the ones place. The tens place is going to be our category and the ones place is going to be our frequency. Let me show you. This stem and leaf diagram represents grades on a statistics test. The stem includes values in the tens column, and the leaves are values in the ones column. I can look at this stem and leaf and see that the lowest score was a 14, and the highest score was a 98. Well, how do I know that? When I look at the top of this stem and leaf diagram, I see a one in the stem and a four in the leaf. The one is in the tens place and the four is in the ones place, giving me a one four or 14. I have included a stem for every possible value 
even though the next highest number is a 26, with a 2 in the 10's place and a 6 in the 1's place. The next value is a 29, followed by a 33, a 43, a 44, a second 44, and continuing through my data set. The highest value in this data set is a 98. Zeros are still numbers, so the number 90 would be represented by a 9 in the tens column, or the stem, and a 0 in the ones column, or the leaf. Now, because this particular data set is so large, or has a larger number of data points, I have subdivided my tens column. Values that range from, let's say, 10 to 14, and then 15 to 19. And I've separated them using an asterisk. The values from 40 to 44 are contained in one column. The values of 45 to 49 are contained in the column with the asterisk. The same with the values in the 50s, and the 60s, and the 70s. I can see the shape of the data. Which column has the most scores? It's the 6 asterisk. Which score occurs most frequently? By counting in the leaves, I can see it is the value of 6, 9. I can figure the high score, the low score, the most frequently occurring score, and the shape of the data. In fact, if I were to turn this stem and leaf sideways, we could see that the shape of the data do in fact reveal a histogram. I could even draw a line over the top of these data and create something that looks like a distribution. I can see the original values, I can see the shape of the data, and this is why I say that a stem and leaf is the best of both worlds. But of course, in order to create one, we're gonna rely on statistical software. And in another video, I'm gonna show you exactly how we can create a stem and leaf diagram quickly and easily.